Old York, New Eli. Press screening. Stressed peeing. <laughs> okay. yeah. That's pretty funny. <laughs> I'm Wilson Lai. I'm Benjamin Yap. I'm Eli Sands. You're listening to Deep Cut. On Deep Cut, we normally compare a director's most popular film with a personal favorite chosen by one of us. We also discuss a director's life and career to bring in context that helps us view their movies as they may want us to. But not today. Dun dun. Not today, Satan. (laughs) (laughs) But today is a continuation of our ongoing Dispatch series where we send people to film festivals and have them come back and report back to us. And... If you're enjoying the show, please remember to give us a rating or a review and subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts. This will help others discover the show. You can also keep up with us at Deep Cut Pod on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd. And if you want to talk about this movie with us or any other film, TV, etc., please join us on our Discord server. If you are a big fan of the show, we've also recently launched a Patreon if you want to help support the show. Click the link in the description or go to deepcutpod.com to find our Patreon, Discord, and all the other socials we've mentioned here. Eli Sands, beloved co-host. Oh, thank you. The feeling is mutual. (laughs) You have been living my dream in the past week (laughs) because you have been at the New York Film Festival. This is true. I have. Um, How has it been? What have you been seeing? And uh, Wilson's not jealous at all. I'm not jealous. <laughs> you know, you, uh, you best best believe. Uh, be glad that this is not a video podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Wilson's full on bullet sweating, <laughs> vein popping out of his forehead. I'm very very happy for you and the chance that you're having to watch all these films <laughs> pre-release <laughs> uh, from a lot of directors and directors that we love on the podcast. Um, so, Eli, how how did you get in and get around this year's New York Film Festival? Yeah, so I'm based in New York, and I produce the Brightwall Darkroom podcast for brightwalldarkroom.com, which is a wonderful site of film criticism and personal essays, really. Very thoughtful curation and writing. Editor-in-chief is Chad Perman, who I work closely with and who wrote me a letter to say, Eli is going to help us out with our festival coverage this year. So New York Film Festival very kindly approved that application. And I got to see four films at this year's festival. I saw Anora, directed by Sean Baker. I saw Ephis, directed by Carson Lund. I saw The Shrouds, directed by David Cronenberg. And I saw Queer, directed by Luca Guadagnino. Overall, the festival has been really fun. You know, I, I go after work and wait online for a little bit, and I've gotten in every time I've tried to see a movie, so it's been nice. The staff working at the New York Film Festival and working at the Walter Reed Theater have been super professional and kind. And I feel very thankful to them in particular because I know that they, they're they the ones who really make it happen at the ground level. It was nice to be on the line and sort of see other critics and meet other critics and see people who I recognize and whose writing I love. At the Screen Slate party on Friday night, I saw Chaos and Collins, who I'm a big fan of. I saw Jordan Searles. I hear that I missed Connor O'Malley by a hair that night, which is too bad. And I also got to see a number of movies with my fellow Brightwall Dark Rumor friend Hoffner, who very kindly invited me to the Screen Slate party and who it was just fun to see movies with. So shout out, Fran. I also saw Queer yesterday with Veronica Fitzpatrick, who co-hosts the Brightwall Dark Room podcast. And it was really lovely to see both of them and reunite with them and catch up and just see movies together. So a really positive experience overall. I had a very fun time. Baby's first press pass. Yeah. So very fun. And and I'm glad that it was New York Film Festival. Show it. Show it. Do you have it? I do. Here. Yeah. Oh, man. 
Oh, it's nice. looking very professional. You picked a good photo. Thank you, thank you. That's my work ID badge photo. <laughs> so double double use. Bro's working. <laughs> He's working the festival. New York Film Festival and Film at Lincoln Center in particular are really like cinematic homes to me. I've mm-hmm. had a number of important viewing experiences there. So it feels really special that my first press pass was at the New York Film Festival. That place and that festival means a lot to me. And yeah, I just feel really grateful to all the work that everyone put in from Bright Wall Dark Room and from the New York Film Festival to make it a really wonderful experience. So it's been great. I've really loved it. Personally speaking, I also really love the New York Film Festival. This is the only festival that all three of us has, have gone to in the past. Wait, I have, not, true. Oh, I have not gone to this they're festival. Mine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's which, wrong. Which, if you're listening, I could. <laughs> yeah, I true. could. This man you know, can fly. Give me a press pass. Yeah, you he know. has time. He can go. I have wings. <laughs> 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 but great festival, great programming. Yeah, I think because you've only seen four films, we can just talk about all four films that you saw. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. I don't know how you want to order it. Do you want to order it from most liked to least liked, or uh, <laughs> now, let's go s- chronologically? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'll let I'll let the listener decide what my ranking was. All right, <laughs> or you can just check Letterboxd. <laughs> So the first film that you saw was Sean Baker's Anora? Yeah, and I'll be up front and say that this was my favorite of the four that I saw. I was really impressed by it. It is about Anora, or Annie as she goes by her nickname, played by Mikey Madison really wonderfully, who mm. is an erotic dancer and sex worker in New York City, contemporary times. She meets Ivan, who is the son of a Russian implied oligarch oil bureaucrat something who is fantastically wealthy and essentially kind of woos her but also hires her services into them getting married in Las Vegas Mm. and things spiral from there. The pace of this movie is phenomenal. It moves at such a clip and when it chooses to slow down is very purposeful I'm thinking a lot about montage from this one. I'm thinking about performance, comedy. It's very funny. And in the end, it is very sad. And huh. it's it's really kind of a total package movie. And I definitely feel like it's my favorite from Sean Baker that I've really? seen. Wow. That's, that's a high bar he needs to clear to make another favorite. <laughs> right. Yeah. Dang, I'm so excited to watch this movie. Yeah, really great movie. I'm I'm excited for both of you to see this. Me too. Me too. Big fan of Sean What else should I be watching out for for this? Or should I just go in blind? I think it's worth going in blind, but I would pay attention to when Baker, who is both director and editor, chooses to hold on one person's face during a conversation as they're listening Mm. and as they're talking. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like rather than go back and forth and give you both perspectives during a conversation, he chooses one for the most part. And I found that choice really compelling and interesting. And it makes it both harder and more interesting to suss out where there's genuine feeling and where there is transaction. Hmm. And if the two overlap and are in some cases the same thing. Mm. I mean, Big is really interesting because so many of his films, if not all of his films, have been about sex work. Yes, yeah. yeah. Right? It, maybe all, uh, if I'm not wrong. Mm. And Does Florida Project have any? I think the, the, the mother, the young mother, is maybe. a sex worker as well. Mm. So, like, that's, like, super fascinating that that has been his obsession, I guess, as a subject matter, or even just, like, characters, because he's gotten to know a lot of sex workers through his research, and has included a lot of that kind of storytelling or character type in his movies. And I think always like kind of quite careful with the material yeah, as he should be. Yeah. And he has such an interesting letterbox history. It's like all B movies mm-hmm. about like sexploitation. I'm just like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like He definitely has his lane. Yeah. yeah. But he, you're, you're right, Ben. He handles it super sensitively and compassionately. And he makes the character's lives not just about their sex work, Mm. even though, as with all of us in capitalism, 
work is a core component of our identity. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it, it bleeds into who we are and <clears throat> we shape it. And he treats that as if it's any other job, mm -hmm. which he should. It's, it's a yeah. progressive take and yeah, just very kind to his mm. characters, even when he's being a little mean to them. <laughs> hey, Wilson, is this coming on Hong Kong? Dude, I don't know, man. There's no... Because if it does, <laughs> it's coming out in a month for me. <laughs> I have not heard anything. Um, so if you guys both have seen it and you want to talk about it in a more like extensive, spoiler-filled kind of way... Emergency episode. You guys can. do a can. Baker series. I would yeah. gladly do a Baker series. I really love Baker. I think Red Rocket was a bit of a miss for me. I just don't like mm. the maybe the the male lead character. Yeah. <laughs> like mm. I, I was yeah was a little Red off Rocket's put by that. Red Rocket's It's tough. Yeah, it's tough. because there's also the it's age not because thing. the central character sucks. Yeah, he's a bit of a dick, <laughs> which is very always difficult. Like it's always difficult to be like my main character sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this one seems really up my alley, and a lot of people are sort of describing this as like a. Like a love story, which mm. I don't, I, I'm mm. always falling for. It's a complicated love story, and there are elements of farce in it as well. Mm. Mm. I'm intrigued, and I will watch it. And uh, if anybody wants to watch more Mikey Madison, she is on FX's Better Things, which is incredible oh, right. that's the pamela adlin yes show? she's yeah, great yeah, yeah. and she plays the oldest daughter i thought you were gonna say the quinton tarantino <laughs> oh i forgot she was in that but yeah she's the great in better things okay this is a total brief aside i am getting really tired of letterbox quipped reviews that are like the top rated review of a movie yeah. mm. and i i the one for annoya the one for Anora really bugs me <laughs> really annoys the you? one for Anora. I find annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what is it? It's I almost didn't recognize Mikey Madison because she's not being set on fire. Oh, okay. Uh, Which I find really kind of gauche and macabre. Not great. I mean, tangential. People on Letterbox, can we chill? Can we? Okay, can we the calm thing is, down? it's okay if it's like people like it, but I think Letterbox needs to show other people's reviews at that space. It's yeah. always taken up by one dumb meme review. Mm -hmm. You know, that's mm -hmm. the problem. And then it keeps being shown to other people and then they keep putting likes on it. So it keeps staying there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But it's not working that algorithm. Just change it up, man. Just like give random reviews. Yeah. I met Mia from Letterboxd, oh. incidentally. You should have told her that. Did you get interviewed? <laughs> Last four, four watch. No, no, four I, 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 last four watch. <laughs> <laughs> this is your last four watch. <laughs> this is my last four watch. That's true. <laughs> She's very kind. I, I enjoyed meeting her. Oh, that's so great. Let's move on. The next film you saw was Carson Bunn's Ephus. Yeah, which I was very excited for because yeah. it features the voice of Frederick Wiseman very briefly. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> We, too, have heard the voice of Frederick Wiseman. Check yeah. out our interview with him. We've, we've heard it live. <laughs> we've heard it live. This is a movie that is about middle-aged guys playing a game of local league baseball on a field that is going to be demolished in order to create a school. So they're having fun. It's a little melancholy. It's very jokey. There are some lightly magical realist things that happen, and mostly it's a hangout movie, and it goes hmm. into the night, and then it kind of ends. I'm feeling a tepid response here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're correct. <laughs> I think it's harmless and funny in places and well-observed in some other places, but it spreads itself a little thin with the cast of characters, and... It, I feel that may, maybe this is an unfair thing, but because Wiseman is in it, I feel like it's trying to do a bit of a Wiseman mm. observe kind of thing. And it also wants to be a light comedy. And mm. Wiseman films are often very funny, but it doesn't quite pull off that type of spontaneous humor that Wiseman relies on. Mm hmm. It's slight, but it's not trying to be more than that. Mm -hmm. And I think my theory is that it did well 
at Cannes and abroad because people who aren't familiar with baseball <laughs> look at it and go like, oh, look at this whole world we're learning about. Huh. Yeah. But it's not a super deep take into it. Mm. It places some thematic things on the table that it, that it doesn't quite return to. But, you know, I don't regret seeing it. It's, it's a nice watch. I think I'm not as into it as I thought I was going to be. Mm-hmm. Someone described this as Goodbye Dragon Inn, but for baseball. Would you say that it is like touching Mm. that slow cinema nerve at all? Or I would not call it slow cinema at all. Okay. Sweet. Nice. (laughs) That's like just dropped in my watch list. (laughs) (laughs) What was the reason you wanted to watch this in the first place? Yeah, because IndieWire had posted back when it was screening at Cannes, IndieWire posted a clip from Ephus that's one of the funniest moments in the film, which is when the team that's on the outfield is trying to distract the person at bat on their opposing team. They start shouting out different deli food items. <laughs> and it's really funny. It's There are some moments that really made me like laugh very loudly. There's a moment when a guy says something and then just farts, and it's, it's <laughs> classic. It's great. But yeah, those really funny moments are kind of not super frequent it's more kind of like light chuckles and Mm -hmm. i think i was expecting a different kind of humor because of that clip that indywire posted which is sort of the only one of that ilk Mm. in the movie Mm -hmm. it does have wayne diamond and keith william richards who are both in uncut gems and it was fun to see them together again oh nice keith william richards in particular is a really good actor and i want to see him more He's probably the performance that stands out the most to me. Okay, let's move on to your man, Mr. David Cronenberg. And his latest film, The Shroud. Weird movie, man. Weird movie. Tell me something I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, maybe that's not so surprising. (laughs) I love Crimes of the Future. It's Mm. a really compelling balance of tone and eerie visuals and kind of highfalutin conspiracy, high-frequency chatter about the world and what's going on. The Shrouds definitely is more dialogue and people talking in rooms, Mm. which is a bit of a letdown. What's this movie about? I I know nothing. Yeah, this movie is about Karsh, who is most certainly a surrogate for David Cronenberg himself, played by Vincent Cassell. Like, look up an image of Vincent Cassell in the shrouds, and you will see, oh, this is David Cronenberg, 100%. Oh, yeah. That's him. (laughs) The hair. In this movie, everyone is horny for David Cronenberg. (laughs) And he's grieving the loss of his wife from six years ago. There's maybe a medical conspiracy as to how she died. There's maybe family subterfuge with his late wife's sister's ex-husband there's technology there's an ai system i'm not even saying what the 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 hook of this movie is actually because there's kind of a lot going on i think perhaps a bit too much but the main hook is that this guy karsh the david cronenberg main character after the death of his wife invented a technology called grave tech and Grave Tech uses these so-called shrouds, which are headstones with a little screen on the face of them mm. that allow you to, through an app, see your decomposing loved one in their grave. Oh. Cool hook, yeah. right? Yeah. But it doesn't do a ton with that. It starts to wander off down the path of conspiracy. And I think charitably I could read this as you know, the spiraling of the mind in a state of extreme grief. Mm -hmm. But the movie, I feel, does get a little distracted. It's at its best when it has some very creepy, sudden heel turn moments, which are superb, and I wanted more of that kind of tone. But it seems that Cronenberg is less interested in that, and it is also very funny at times, and that feels on purpose. But I'm not sure why. So not my favorite Cronenberg, but it has some ideas that I'm intrigued by and would see a more concentrated version of. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't know he was so old. I just looked it up. He's 81. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, dude's old. And yeah. da- David Cronenberg's wife like died a few years ago as well, right? So this is like oh, also yes. like, autobiographical in that kind of way. Fran said after the screening that if she were Cronenberg's late wife oh. and saw this movie somehow, she would think it was a sweet gesture. Okay, okay, okay. I thought, I you was gonna, so. I thought Fran was going to say something much worse. No, <laughs> no, I mean, no, 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 no. She was into it. If okay. you're married to Cronenberg, you're a f- little freak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, come on. No. <laughs> but then, what if you were, like, dead and then, like, your 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 spouse made, like, a very mid-movie to, like, to celebrate your life? I would be, fu- I would dis- I'd be disappointed. You can't even make it mid on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> the goal is definitely not celebrating her life, though. It's sort of processing what comes after a loved one is gone. There's a really interesting blend of stoicism and humor in this. Mm. Like, there's not a ton of exasperated grief. Really, that's only the opening moment of the film. But there's a look at the comedy of grief. Mm. Maybe that's more of a cohering thing about the movie than I wanted. I I wanted creepy. Mm. But maybe that's not a fair expectation of the movie and not meeting it on its own terms. Yeah. I'm still there interested. is some great creepy here. Would you revisit it or would it just like sort of like fall? You would like revisit other Cronenberg movies before you would revisit, revisit this? Probably the latter. I definitely would give it another shot, but there's still gaps in my Cronenberg knowledge. Mm. The two favorites of mine remain Crash and Crimes of the Future, which mm. get their tone very precisely mm. and rely less on dialogue and plot than mm. his other movies i believe mm-hmm. like i think about crimes and what you're telling me about the shrouds is like they're equally like super high concept like a lot of yes. stuff going on it's and they like, look similar cinematographically as well huh. they have a similarly kind of plasticky sheen in a way that i find very compelling all right Ooh. you're making me think about megalopolis for some dumb reason me but okay. <laughs> which you both saw like yeah. quick digression talk about megalopolis digression no quick digression <laughs> Do May, it. We might do an episode on it. Yeah. Just, oh, okay. 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 We'll find out. Yeah. We'll right, find we'll out, listeners. That. You will find <laughs> out. Our last film that we're going to talk about is something that's related to a series that we're going to continue n- next episode. So this is great yeah. placement right here. This is Luca Guadagnino's Queer, which is the second film that he had come out this year. Yeah. Man's on a roll. He is. How did you feel about this? He's on a roll. Maybe he should slow down a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) I think, Wilson, you are going to love this movie. Okay. I think that there's a lot there that I was very into. And similarly to The Shrouds, I didn't quite feel it cohered. But there's a lot, particularly in the first half, that I was really wooed by. Mm -hmm. The sex scenes are some of Guadagnino's most compelling, very tactile and moving and emotional. Craig is sort of interestingly postured in this movie, similar to Power of the Dog, where you have a British actor playing an American who's hiding something about his identity in a layered, meta-textual kind of way. Mm -hmm. That's kind of going on here. But, yeah, I admire the the gutsiness of this. Mm. It, It makes a lot of interesting choices and i also wasn't sure how to lock together the pieces by the end Mm. i should say queer is about william lee who is a version of william s burroughs the author who wrote the book that this movie is based on william lee is living in mexico city and he is an expat writer he's gay and he trawls the city at night looking for lovers and one day he finds drew starkey's Jean, who he becomes infatuated with and that begins a multi-chapter saga of their relationship over the course of maybe a year or so Mm. the movie takes some fantastic turns and i mean fantastic in the literary sense like it's huh hmm i'm not sure at what level to take certain parts of the movie as literal or not Mm. but that's interesting yeah there are things that 
made me laugh that I don't think the movie wanted me to laugh at. Unfortunately, mm. there's an, a very extended ayahuasca trip that gets <laughs> yeah. silly. <laughs> I, heard, oh. I heard about that. Do you think that's, yes. a, that's a first for Guadagnino? I don't know. I think perhaps because he's very good at... No, you know what? You know what it reminded me of? What? Suspiria. Uh, okay. Because oh. he tends to be very anchored in the tactility of reality, but he has gone into surreality a couple of times, mm -hmm. chiefly in Suspiria. Mm -hmm. And he does it again here. And I don't know if I feel qualitatively about it one way or the other, but it was interesting. And... It felt new for him, uh, but also familiar in some ways. Among the other firsts of Guadagnino's career, this has, I believe, the longest single take in any Guadagnino oh, movie. Oh, yeah, <laughs> baby! Oh, yeah! Yeah! And it's of Daniel Craig shooting up heroin. Yeah! Oh. <laughs> Wilson. <laughs> Will I be able to watch this movie here? <laughs> Damn, that's a lot of drug use. <laughs> I think that this could be a classic Wilson loves it, Eli's mixed, and Ben hates it kind of movie. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I I don't know whether I'll be able to see this movie till like God knows when. It's like it's trying to get banned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In this country. <laughs> This is like night and day from like Challenger. It feels so different from Challenger. Well. Partially. I think it has DNA in common with a lot of his other movies. There's mm. the tactility of I Am Love. There is the eerie imagery and surreality of Suspiria. There's the kind of pacing and restless edit of Challengers. Ooh. There's the star persona kind of vehicle of his work with Tilda Swinton mm. in a lot of ways. Mm. There's the... Endless summer vacation of a bigger splash. Oh. There's the expat component of a bigger splash and I am love mm -hmm. and Suspiria. Mm -hmm. And we are who we are. And we are who we mm -hmm. are. True. Yeah. yeah. So it does congeal a lot of his focuses, mm -hmm. but it is also messy in a way that feels brave and bold. And even when it doesn't quite work for me, I was glad that I saw it. And I do think that, Wilson, you're going to love this movie. Dude, this is like the third time you said this to me. So I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm picking it up. I'm picking now it I'm up. No. <laughs> I'm overhyping it. Even your three-star review, I read it and I was like, I'm still, I'm going to love it. I'm going to love it. I know. <laughs> I was going to say, no, I just went to look up who shot it. And it's also... Mookie oh, Mookie from. Yeah. Because yep. I was kind of curious about that because I think I read about how this was a much more difficult edit compared to Challengers. I believe that entirely. Right? And so I'm really curious about that messy process. I think mm. the messy edit works. Mm. It's, okay. it's searching. Mm. Wow. In a way that the character is. And interestingly, Guadagnino is, I think, directly citing a lot of different directors, including Wong Kar Wai, including Nicholas Rogue. Mm. Uh Hong Sang Su is in there a little bit. Naming a lot of deep cut directors here. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, and both past, past and future. And future. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, <laughs> Luca Guadagnino, avid deep cut listener. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. There's Almodovar in there for sure. There's Lynch. There's Fellini, Buñuel, Maya Deren, Damn. Jonathan Glazer, Pedro Costa. I tracked all these people in there, and yeah, it's huh. it's an interesting hodgepodge. Wow, it's messy. I think on purpose. You know what? I'm seated. You have to be seated, Ben, because we have to talk about it. So yeah, we gotta <laughs> we do. Yeah, catch us maybe in a few months or in a year. God knows how long yeah. it's going to take before this reaches <laughs> Asia. <laughs> yeah. It's 824, so my guess is it will be out not too There's far a chance, away. but it's really Maybe hard in to the spring. Yeah. yeah. But it, it doesn't seem Maybe. like the, the crowd pleaser that Challengers was, which allowed it to have it like not. that worldwide Most release. Most assuredly. Mm. Yeah. It definitely won't have wide release in Singapore, but I think there's a chance that it will still come in due time because of the star power in it. Mm. I think Luca as star power as well, not just Craig. Yeah. Yeah. But hard to Drew say. Starkey is. Oh, Drew great. Starkey. Oh, nice. he is so attractive. It's a good looking man. A good looking man. <laughs> He's really good looking. <laughs> 
a uh, Ben, you you might be able to see it in like a month or two, maybe because Wait, the SGIF lineup hasn't come out yet. So oh, you're right. It it could happen. Mm. It could really it could happen. happen. It could really happen. It could happen, and I could be doing one of these. You will be doing one of True. these, Ben. <laughs> I'm forcing I will you. Be, apparently. <laughs> oh no, my boss is telling me to work. <laughs> 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 yeah, but this is a great discussion about these films you saw. Yeah, I'm sorry you didn't get to watch all the other films because you got COVID. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. <laughs> Such a bummer. That sucked. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, the things that I missed primarily are The Brutalist and A Real Pain that I wanted to catch. Mm-hmm. And those are coming out pretty soon, I think. They are. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm curious about those both. I really wanted to see Nickel Boys oh, because don't we all? That, I'm so curious how that translates from the book, and it's getting rave reviews. But it was during my work day, so I couldn't go see it. Yeah, Harvest. I'm curious about all the light we cannot see. Yeah, the the new Almodovar. Oh my god, I heard it was great. Uh, Fran and Veronica both loved mm. it. Eli, are you gonna return back to New York Film Festival next year? I hope so. I mean. You know, I don't have plans to go anywhere with Brightwell Dark Room, which I guess is a nice opportunity to say thank you again. Chad and Veronica, you both know that I love working with you. And yeah, I am I feel really lucky and grateful that I got to go to the festival this year as a member of the press. It was really exciting and very, very fun. And next year, too, as Deep Cut. It could happen. Yeah, true. <laughs> you know, we do coverage on festivals. We do that. We do. We definitely do. Right now. If any festivals are listening. <laughs> yeah. We've done Sundance. We've done HKIFF. We've done New York Film Festival. We're about to do Singapore International Singapore. Festival. This is the only podcast is all across the world. That's and true. we will come to you if you give us a press pass. <laughs> yeah. Like literally no other podcast has done what we are doing. Talk about movies. <laughs> yeah. And talk about how we like the sneaky ways that we get press passes to festival. <laughs> Skimming off the top of my bright wall dark room <laughs> assignment to, to make our New York Film Festival coverage. <laughs> now we need to hear about how you got how you eventually will get your SGIF uh, press pass then next Yeah, let's next find month. out. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask everybody I know working there, which is like I think I know at least 50% of the stuff there. <laughs> ben just wears a big top hat that says, I am press. Well, like I just show up and I just tell people I'm press. I'm like, yeah, I'm press. Yeah, you know yeah, I'm press. press. <laughs> Hi, my name's Press. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of Deep Cut. Please rate and review because that helps us keep making the show and helps others discover the show as well. Be sure to subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts so you'll know when our next episode drops. Keep up with Deep Cut on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd at Deep Cut Pod. You can also join us to talk about movies on our Discord server. We also now have a free Patreon. If you want to subscribe to see exclusive content, or if you want to support us, we'd deeply appreciate it either way. Click the link in our description, or go to deepcutpod.com to find our Patreon, Discord, and all the other socials that we've mentioned here. Thank you to our Deep Cut Pick tier Patreon supporter, Leah Lai. Our biggest fan? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Deep Cut is hosted and produced by us, Wilson Lai, Benjamin Yap, and Eli Sands. This episode was edited by Wilson Lai, and our cover art is designed by Justina Yam. Our theme song is composed by me, Eli Sands. I'm Wilson. I'm Ben. I'm Eli. Take care. And we're looking forward to talking about more movies with you next time. Yeah. Woo!